It is not always easy to watch, but this is the reality of an epidemic of domestic abuse that takes place in all races, all regions, and all across economic lines in this country. In fact, while you're watching this program, there will be an estimated 250 assaults on women in America. In a nice neighborhood in upstate New York, in a nice house like the ones you know, behind closed doors, a father commands his 13-year-old son to pick up a camera and start recording. Look at me. You play those stupid games with me, I'll knock your teeth out of your face. The father delivers a verbal flogging to the mother in front of their children. You act like a in front of the kids. It will go on for nearly an hour. You little slut. If I see a dog, I won't stop. I won't stop. It is domestic abuse, the kind we hear about but often don't believe. I don't want to see a stupid cook itself. Stupid ass effort. Susan is 42 years old. They have three children. The father, Ulner, directs his 13-year-old son, the cameraman, to get a close-up of their emotionally battered mother. Zoom in. Do you see a tear? No. Not a tear out of that face. Yep, I got that. He indicates he wants the tape to prove that his anger at his wife is justified. What prompts his tirade? Susan asks him if he'd like some lunch. Come over here with this stupid yeah. And stir it up. No, you didn't leave. You didn't just come ask me about lunch. He even makes his 13-year-old son join him in blaming her. And you enjoy getting that because that's obvious. Yes, you do. Because you know it provokes it. And you yeah. do it anyway. You do it anyway. And if you're wondering what kind of woman would endure something like this if you're certain she's nothing like you, well, take a look at Susan on tape three years ago and look at the woman she really is today what do you see when you look at her a woman desperate desperately trying to save whatever she can salvage of her family desperately trying to please her husband and do whatever it is that he wants her to do according to a department of justice survey one in four american women experience domestic violence for susan the story begins when she is 18 years old the daughter of a black father, a white mother, who falls in love with a 26-year-old guitarist in a popular local band. He is talented, charismatic. His name is Ulner. I would go to see him play on the weekends, and we'd talk on the phone, and we just sort of grew to know each other. Did you say to yourself, I'm happy? Absolutely. They got married. He worked as a musician, she with a health insurance company, and they had their three children. We're covering their faces at her request. Everyone looks at you, and I know the first thing they would think is, so beautiful, so oh, intelligent. You. you must have been able to take care of yourself in any situation. <laughs> I, was, I was shy. I was very green. You know, my world was absolutely inside of the walls of our home. She says at first her husband was just very demanding and controlling not so different from her own father, whom she described as overbearing. But she says the more she tried to comply with her husband's demands, the more obsessive his control. Did you have friends over for dinner? Never, never. He never wanted friends over. He never wanted men in his house in particular. And your father and stepfather didn't know about this? My um, husband had cut me off from my father and family. Um, for many years. How are you going to say something stupid like that? Like and you can hear on the videotape how his badgering, his criticism wore her down by twisting her words. When I was watching my son do something, and he said, don't look at him like you're interested in what he's doing. And I said, I think I am interested in what my children do. I think I'm interested in my children. And he turned that into, I think think I'm interested in what my children do. So you can think you care about your children, whatever you want to think you care about. You don't. And then he turned it into, I think I love my children. All in the same conversation. That phrase turned into something totally different. In that 51-minute tape, Ulner calls Susan stupid 36 times. And just you standing there talking stupid like this, you know, because she used to be on your knees apologizing to you stupid effort. The rants. Yes. The, the mental and verbal abuse. Just 
hours. I mean, he would call it a family meeting. And these family meetings were all about what mommy did wrong today. He totally had my children completely on his side, completely brainwashed. Not only could I not believe his behavior, but I couldn't believe my own children's behavior. She says the verbal abuse had gone on for years before the words became fists. She says the first time he hit her, it was because she forgot something he wanted at a nearby grocery store. Her oldest child, her daughter, was 19. He beat me down to the floor. I was crawling on the floor trying to get away. I remember my daughter turning on the vacuum cleaner so that my younger children couldn't hear it. You know more what's going on at work than in your own house. At the time of the tape, she was working, he was not. He was jealous of men on the outside. And this got to do with somebody at work. It does Half not. A... I don't have anyone. Half a lie. I can't tell you how many baseball coaches I was accused of, swimming teachers, um, karate teacher, other parents, anything. They know this line. But her greatest agony was the role of her children. When you think your son was on the other side of that lens. Not only that, my younger son was right there also. He was in the room. Their youngest son, eight years old. Coming up, toward the end of the tape, Ulner explodes in violence. You were sorry you wouldn't come up here. Wouldn't do that. You know, you would have left if you came up here. Ask me that again. And so what does the son do? And what about the question everyone wants to know? Why on earth didn't she just leave? Follow what I say to the teeth. So June 22, 2003, terrifying images of physical abuse, the kind the experts say takes place every 15 seconds someplace in this country. The difference is, this is caught on video. You don't know what to do. Look at your stupid ass. Look at the way you look. Behind the camera, a 13-year-old boy watching his mother slapped, slugged, and throttled by his father. You keep playing at one point, yeah, for nearly three minutes, the son seems... To the, teeth. the terrified mother, Susan, covers her face while the father, Ulner, strangles her, throws her to the floor. You have a stupid... about your stupid stuff. And you don't learn after I beat your... You do not learn. When you look back, are you amazed you didn't crack? And was the thought of my children. And impossible as it is to believe, as this was going on, she still managed to care for the children, the house, and work at a part-time job. Her boss was Lynn Jasper, who started picking up on something unsettling, the way she heard Susan talk to her husband on the phone at the end of the day. I'm calling you now to tell you that I'm leaving so you can clock the time that it takes me to get home. And if I vary from that course, what punishment am I going to have to suffer when I get there? And a phrase Susan uses on the phone horrifies Lynn. And when I called, I had to call him master. Yes, master. No master. And you hear it the first couple times and you think, wow, what a sick individual. You're going to work and functioning in the workplace and then coming back to this prison. Yes. I think that any... Any independent, strong-willed woman would be quick to say and i'll admit i was one of them why doesn't she just leave why why would you take that again it's the question everyone asks and cannot cannot understand people and i know what that question is why didn't you just leave why didn't you leave a lot of it is preservation of family. I didn't want to see my family destroyed. And in my eyes, because of what he was telling me, I was the problem. So all I had to do was fix me. On average, it will take seven tries for a woman to leave her abuser. The psychological chains as strong as any metal. He had literally physically and mentally beat me down to nothing. I thought I was not as good as a piece of dirt on his shoe. And that's a place that is hard to come out of. May 6, 2003, back at the office, Lynn notices that Susan has a wound on her head. I asked her, I said, hmm, 
What happened to your head? And I said, oh, I was pulling a box off the shelf in the closet, and the corner of the box fell and hit me in the eye. But Lynn makes note of the day on her calendar, and she continues to take notes for herself when she sees something worrying. On May 20th, 2003, Lynn notices that Susan arrives late to work. She tucked her hair behind her ear, and her whole ear was bruised. And then it occurred to me that, dear God, she, it's not that she's ignoring me. She probably can't hear me. Her husband had ruptured her eardrum with the back of his hand. It seems she had broken one of her husband's new rules, forbidding her to hug and kiss her own children. Just three days later, another set of bruises, including on the face and back of her hands, recorded by Lynn in her calendar. I came in very, very upset. I couldn't, couldn't contain it. She started to cry, and we had gone into a room privately, and I'd closed the blinds. And she said, okay, Susan, what's going on? And I need you to know that I'm here for you. She told me a lot of what was going on, but you know what? Not even close to the whole story. And then I begged her not to tell anyone. Begged her. Because I didn't want my husband to get in trouble. So much was happening inside that house. He had kicked her with his sneakers, beat her with a hardcover book, struck her repeatedly with a belt. And finally, Susan became so terrified, she slipped a letter into Lynn's desk drawer. I opened one of the lower drawers of my desk, and there was an envelope in there. It had my name on it. And I remember reading it and just getting physically just sick, like, to the point where I actually it actually made me throw up. The letter was for her children, in case she died. The letter that Susan wrote to her boys was just her whole heart on a piece of paper. And there was no mistaking the fact that she knew that he was not at all beyond killing her. You do think he would have killed you? I know he would have. I know he would have. Then, a month later, the videotaped episode of June 22nd that changed everything for Susan. Up that and when I looked in his eyes, my husband wasn't there anymore. His eyes were empty. And you gonna sit up there and tell me you don't know what to do? No, wait a minute. You gonna tell me? Through what would be her long final night at home, Susan planned her escape. I got up and piled on makeup, hoping that he wouldn't look at me too hard because my face was very battered. And I dropped my um, older son off at school. And I went to work. When Susan walked in on the last day, she was beaten and marked worse than I had seen. And I remember saying to her, it's got to stop. It has to, it ends here. I looked at her and I said, today's the day. Once I said to Lynn, that was it, she said, OK, I'm calling and went and did it immediately. With the help of police over the next few hours, she ran a heart-pounding race against the clock. Since her husband patrolled every minute of her day, she had to get to the children before he did and before he made an irrational move. And I knew that my husband was gonna be looking for me. First, she raced to pick up her youngest son at elementary school and took him to the police station. The police picked up her older boy. But Susan's phone had been ringing and ringing. Officer Kathy Onions. We decided to have Susan call the residence and speak to her husband to reassure him that uh, she picked up the son as she was instructed to. We wanted to document what his response was to this conversation and, uh, you know, and have it on a tape. Hello, honey. Where are you? I'm afraid to come home. I'm afraid to come home. You're stupid. You mean what you mean you're afraid to come home? You better bring the son home. If you don't bring my son home, I'm gonna kill you, Emma. I don't want you to hurt me. What I'm afraid to come home. At another point, Alder talked directly to Officer Onions. He told me that uh, he controls them, that he tells them what to do, they're his property, and he can tell me to release them. And I explained to him that that's not how it works. But domestic abuse cases are notoriously difficult. It would be his word against hers. And what would the children say, including her daughter, who wanted to stay with her dad? The question loomed, would Ulner be free to come after Susan again?
Coming up, the courtroom showdown that would change history for abused women. As a prosecutor, this was perhaps the most cocky and arrogant individual as a defendant. He was convinced that he could control his world and the world at large. He was convinced he could control me, the judge, and the jury. And Sawyer. After years of physical and emotional abuse, a woman takes her two sons to a shelter for battered women. Her daughter remains with the abusive husband. Susan returned with us to the place that had been her first sanctuary. I remember the relief of knowing nobody was going to berate me today. Nobody's going to hit me today. Oh, wow. I remember. But as we said, domestic abuse is notoriously hard to prosecute. It's his word against hers. But a week after Susan's escape, when police officers were interviewing her, she casually dropped a bombshell. Again, Officer Kathy Onions and Officer Cindy Herberger. Excuse me, did you see a videotape? And she goes, oh, yes. Um, my older son was made to videotape this whole assault. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And I just looked over at Kathy, and my eyes went big, and her eyes went big at me. You don't know what to do. You follow me to the T. You follow what I say to the T. But if you think having T. that video alone would seal an abuser's fate, you, know you are wrong. What would he be convicted of if there were only that tape? Class A misdemeanor. That's all. Maximum jail time one year, which in reality is nine months. This is inconceivable. When you see it and you say, that's all the law considers this to be a misdemeanor? You don't have serious physical injury. She has bruises. She has bumps. Get your off that floor and sit up. So based on the tape alone, Ulner could have been out in less than a year. And he also insisted that the rest of the time the family had been happy. John O'Donnell was presiding judge in the case. He continued to say that, that uh, they were the Cosby family. When the prosecution offered Ulner a deal of four years to protect the children from a trial? He absolutely rejected that sentence in a heartbeat. Prosecutor Lisa Rodwin. And he said, no one will believe her. The children won't testify against me. I will win. What Ulner apparently did not realize was that his wife had that guardian angel with a calendar. In the end, those notes would help prosecutors charge him with 12 separate vicious assaults against his wife. This was a vital piece of physical evidence for the jury to see that somebody else could verify what happened, that she was hurt, that she saw bruises, and these are the dates. Susan's children are called to testify. Her eldest son is still a reluctant witness, but he does tell the jury that his father whipped his mother with a belt and the younger son, the little one. For him to talk about dad hitting mom was emotionally wrenching. He started sobbing uncontrollably on the stand. But the eldest, the daughter, will stand by her father and testify that she never witnessed a single incident of abuse. In the end, Ulner is found guilty on all counts. The judge, who will never forget that searing tape, hands down a sentence of 36 years the videotape is... It's terrible. And as you can see, it's still... Still gets to me. According to the prosecutor, the sentence would be the longest in New York history for a domestic violence case in which the victim managed to stay alive. People say you get murder convictions that don't have that kind of sentence. What the judge said at sentencing was, you have destroyed this family as much, if not more, than if you had committed a murder. It was an unusual case, and it required some unusual punishment. So 36 years is? To see somebody that you once loved go to prison for 36 years, even after everything he did to me, it wasn't something that made me happy. Three years later, Susan and her children are still trying to regain their lives. The youngest doing well. The oldest child, her daughter, who spent the most years under Elner's control, is having the toughest time. Are you estranged from her now? She's okay. She's um, working very hard 
at being okay. And what about the son who made that videotape? He and his mother are together. Does your older son understand how he was used and manipulated now? Yes, he does. No forgiveness is needed. Oh, absolutely. From the start, my children knew that. You know, I could never hold them responsible for what happened there. And her son's tape has now become a potent weapon against abuse. Susan now uses it at police academies to put a personal face on an epidemic. Remember that if you go to somebody's door, that woman's going to tell you, no officer, no problem. She'll hug her abuser, smile at him. Because she knows when you leave, if she doesn't say the right thing, she's going to get it. She's going to get it. If someone you know is struggling with abuse at home, there is help out there. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is available day and night at 1-800-799-SAFE, 799-SAFE. We've also put a list of other contacts on 2020's webpage at abcnews.com, and we hope you'll use it. We'll be right back.